Hallelujah. Well, that was awesome, the worship team. That was beautiful. It was so good. And, um, so before I begin today, I want to welcome a new member of our church here today and say congratulations to Joshua and Haley Lukinovich. Elijah David Lukinovich was born on Wednesday, right? Wednesday, and she, here Haley is in church on Sunday with her son, so it's just such a beautiful thing. And um, the Lukinovich, looks like the Lukinovich name is going to continue yeah. to expand and get out there. And you're not, you're not going to be able to get rid of the Lukinoviches. I'm sorry. My, my brother, my twin brother has a, has a uh, son, uh, Noah, so that's going to continue. So you, you're going to be dealing with the Lukinoviches for a little while, I think. But we're so proud of him. He came a little early, not too early. He's fine, but he came a little earlier than expected. But, you know, those, those babies, they're going to come when they're ready to come, not when the doctor says they're coming. And, uh, but we're just so excited about that. God is just so good to us. And um, we're just so proud of them. And uh, just for being here, just a testimony to me that y'all are in church here um, today. So, so praise God, I'm excited today. Um, you know, as I begin here, you know, I just want to ask the question, can anything stop the plans and purposes of the Lord? You know, can anything stop God's desire and God's will? Isaiah 14, 24 says, The Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will happen. And another translation says, The Lord Yahweh, commander of angel armies, makes this solemn decree. Be sure of this. Just as I have planned, so it will be. Every purpose of my heart will surely come to pass. We are not going to stop the will and purpose of God. Last week I began a two-part message titled Fighting Against God. And today is going to be the conclusion of that in the second part here. And in last week's message, I shared that God, God's kingdom is, is advancing. The Bible says that it suffers violent attacks, but in spite of, it, in spite of the violent attacks, the kingdom of God is advancing. And we, we are uh, evidence of this here this morning, of the kingdom of God advancing here today. Though it suffers violent assaults, it marches on. Its plan will prevail because... It's not initiated by man, nor is it connected to man. In a sense, it's not dependent on human strength for its survival. God, God, it, it's God's plan. The kingdom of God is God's will. Salvation, the cross, Christ, the Bible, everything that God is doing, it's for man, but it's not. It's, man has nothing to do with God's purposes and will for his kingdom. It is an unstoppable supernatural force moving at the direction and will of God. God is, he, he's orchestrating everything that he's doing, and his will and his plan will, will, will succeed. So you and I as believers in Jesus are part of this advancing kingdom. We, we are part of that if we are confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And just as God caused supernatural events to keep it advancing to this day, so he, he will continue to cause supernatural events to happen to, to, to keep it moving forward from this day on. So we shouldn't be surprised when God does something supernatural for the kingdom to continue to advance, we should expect those things to happen. And um, so we're, we're a part of that. This church is part of this advancing kingdom, and his will and his purpose will prevail for us. Um, I received a text message this morning. You know, we, we belong to the NRP. It's, a, it's not a denomination. It's just an affiliation of like-minded churches. And NRP stands for Network of Related Pastors. And um, Y'all met Pastor Keith Tusi. He came in here. He's the um, overseer of the network. But there's other pastors that, that are there that we, that we connect to. And we get to meet these guys at, at our national conference and also at the Band of Brothers conference. But one of the brothers that I've kind of got connected with a little bit is Brother Keith Hodges. And Keith is a pastor in, uh, in, in uh, Alabama. And um, he last couple of Sundays, he's been sending me a, a text message just to encourage me. And the message he sent today, I thought was appropriate for my message today, but I'm just going to read it to you. It's really short. He, said, good, he says, good morning, mighty man of God. Today as you stand to preach, stand tall, be bold, courageous, and confident in the one who has sent you. You are his mouthpiece. Resist fear, press through discouragement, and rise up. You are God's man, and I am covering you. I am covering you. And then he has hashtag give, give them heaven. Joshua 1.9 says, this is... This is my command to be strong and courageous. 
Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And, um, but it's just so encouraging, and he sent another, another message here, um, uh, just encouraging us and letting us know that we are a part of God's kingdom and, and what it is that God's doing. So we need to understand that, that we not, may not be a big body here, but we are part of something great and much larger and much bigger than what God is doing across the planet and across the globe. So it's extremely important for us to realize that and, for understand, and to understand that. But just going to give a recap of last week's message as a, as a follow through with what I'm going to speak here today. But, but um, this is a, a continuation of the passage in Acts chapter 5. And I shared this last week that the book of Acts, I believe, gives the church an illustration and a demonstration of what it was that God's desire was for his church. Jesus had, had ascended to heaven. He, he, he left his apostles and the disciples with the, with, with, with the command to go and to preach the gospel, to preach the good news. And then we see the book of Acts recorded, I believe, the church in action. And I don't believe that's ever stopped. It, we are, I believe, a continuation of the book of Acts, that, that everything in the book of Acts was God's plan and his desire for the church today. Those things that happened there didn't stop there. I, I believe that, that was God showing us this is how the church operates, and this is what it's going to look like when the church is operating. So, But if you look at that, the apostles in the book of Acts, they were performing and doing everything that the Lord Jesus had commanded them to do. Um, they were teaching in his name. They were healing. They were performing miracles spreading the good news of his salvation. And, um, but as you read the book of Acts, and, and even in the Bible, what you find in almost every instance, as they're sharing the gospel, they came against resistance. There was opposition. There, there, there was hatred. There was attack. And all they were doing was proclaiming Jesus. They were proclaiming the truth of who Christ was, that he was the Messiah, and he was the good news, not just for Israel, but for the whole world, that, that, that in him their sins could be forgiven. That's all they were doing. They, they, they were preaching the good news, but they were hated. If you read the book of Acts and you see this, and, there, and, and chapter 5 is, a, um, is an example of this that we read. I'm going to read this passage again this morning. Um, as we look at this, the, of the, and we'll, you'll see the fierce opposition that they were, that they were facing. But we all, in this passage, we find the fierce opposition to the apostles. We find miraculous intervention by God, and we found a profound revelation from one of the Pharisees named Gamaliel. And, and this, is to, this is the highlight of the passage that I want to look at, but I'm going to read this passage again in Acts chapter 5. It says, Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. For during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priests and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. 
But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men railed to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed. And it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And what, a, what an amazing account, what an amazing story that is there. And the book of Acts is filled with stories similar to that. But just to recap what, I just, what we covered last week, and uh, the first thing I was looking at is advancing the gospel will invite opposition. We, we have to understand as we move forward as believers, and I've said this to this church before, you are a moving target as a Christian. You are living in a world that you don't belong in. You are living in a place that doesn't want you, doesn't like you, and for all practical purposes, it hates you. It, it hates the truth that is in you. It, 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 it despises the gospel. So it, it should never come as a shock to us that when we try to promote the gospel or live a life for Christ, that we're going to come against resistance. There's going to be opposition. That, that, that should not be a surprise to us. So advancing the gospel is going to invite opposition. It, it, it's going to happen. It's just as I said, the, the Bible says the kingdom suffers violent assault. But, but although it suffers violent assault, it still prevails. The, the, the message of the gospel still prevails, but it prevails not without a fight and dedicated perseverance. We are advancing a kingdom in a world that hates God, so we should expect to be there to be pushback. Then the second thing we looked at was advancing God's kingdom requires his miraculous intervention. And I love the story if you look at that. And the, the story doesn't tell us this, that the apostles, they, they, I don't believe that they were expected to be rescued from the jail. We don't, there's no indication that they said they were praying or asking or believing or expecting it. The Bible says an angel appeared out of nowhere. They were in the jail. The Bible says the angel came in. Doesn't give the details of how it happened, but we know it was a miracle because if you read the rest of the story, it says when the Sanhedrin went back to go find the apostles, the, do the doors were locked and the guards were at their station. They were at their place. So whatever happened, happened like it was miraculous. It was a miraculous intervention by God that, that, God, that God miraculously rescued, rescued the, 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 the apostles and got them released from that prison. So um, again, this, this gospel, this, this kingdom, this plan of God's, it's God's plan. It's not, it's not ours. God's going to do whatever it takes to keep it going. If, if it takes miraculous intervention, God's going to do miracles. And I, I believe it's time for the church to start expecting God to do those things, to start looking for God to do those things, because that's what God does. That's how this thing has survived and succeeded. It hasn't been on man's strength. It's been on God's, God's power and God's intervention. So we should be expecting these things to happen. And then the other thing I looked at was we are advancing God's kingdom, not, not man's. And um, when, they, when, when they were arrested, the, the, the men told them, that said, we're going to release you, but we're telling you, don't, don't preach anymore in this name. We, we are telling you, stop speaking in the name of Jesus. And Peter and the apostles looked at him and said, we must obey God rather than human beings. And that, that's really our, our mandate as a believer. And that's the mandate of this church. We must obey God. That, that God, God is king. Jesus is king. And that, that's our first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So God, God is first. So we must lay aside every idol that competes with the purposes of God. This is the apostles that we must obey God first. So, but today in part two of this message, I, 
really want it to be more focused about you and, and about your life and, 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 and fighting against God, do you know that the Lord is fighting for you? You know, we, we, we look at this passage and we see that God was fighting for his, for his gospel. God was fighting for the apostles. But do we realize as Christians that God is fighting for us? That, that God is on your side if you're a believer. That God, that, that God is fighting for you and you are part of his kingdom. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God says that we are chosen. God says that we are royal. You are a royal priesthood. God says we are holy. Holy because of us? No, holy because of Christ, because of Jesus. And then the Bible says that we are God's possession. We are God's. This is God's plan. This is God's, God's desire. So that puts you and I in a position of victory. I, I'm in a, if God is on my side, I'm victorious. I'm in a position of victory in, Je in, in Jesus' name. That puts me on God's side, and he is fighting for you and me. But I want to focus on the profound revelation given by this non-believer in this passage, Gamaliel. And I, I got to think that Gamaliel was a lot like Nicodemus that he recognized, even though that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were rejecting who Jesus was, Nicodemus knew that there was something different about Jesus. And I got to believe Gamaliel saw the same thing, that, hey, wait a minute, there's something different <laughs> about this man. And look at the profound revelation that for all practical purposes, he was, he was a non-believer. He, he didn't believe who Jesus Christ said he was, yet look at the, the profound response that he gave. And I believe what he saw, a lot of Christians fail to recognize the revelation that he was able to see. But, but I believe that God's going to show us some stuff here this morning. But in Acts chapter 5, he said, Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find, your, find yourselves fighting against God. So the first thing I want to look at is if God is for you, who can stand against you? Have you ever thought about that? I, I think a lot of times we read the Bible and we see these scriptures and we just glance over that and we're like, okay, that's what the Bible says. But do, do we ever pause and look at what we're reading? The Bible says if God is for us, who can stand against us? Think about that. Not, not your friend, not your mother, not your father. God. The Bible says, if God is for us, who can stand against us? See, Gamaliel, in his reply, he exposed a critical component in their quest to stop the apostles. Guess what it was? God. They, they forgot one person when they were thinking about stopping the apostles. They forgot God. But Gamaliel thought about that. He goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If this isn't from God, you ain't got to worry about it. It's not going to work. And he gave the examples of the other two men that tried to lead him back, whatever they did, that it failed. So he knew, don't worry about it. If it's not from God, it's not going to happen. But if it is from God, you're not going to succeed. That's profound. That, 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 that's, un that, that's unbelievable. But see, Christians, I believe, too often see themselves as the underdog in the Christian race. We see ourselves as the minority. And we are in the physical. <laughs> in the physical sense, we are the minority. But as you read the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you find Israel and God's people were always outnumbered. It's almost like every time God sought to do something with the nation of Israel, or even now here in the book of Acts, it's like they were, it, was like, it was like Israel against the world, like against kingdom and kings and, 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 and just opposition that was impossible to defeat. There was no way that they could overcome that. It, it was it, it, in, almost, in almost every instance, everything in the world seemed against them, and it was. However, they had one ally the world could not match. The Lord of Heaven's armies was on their side. See, you, you might be the minority, but you only need one ally. His name is Jesus. <laughs> he is Lord. See, if you got that ally on your side, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. You got the greatest defender you could ever have. His name is Jesus Christ. See, governments will be against you. 
Your employer might be against you. Your family might be against you. But none will succeed because God is for us. God is for us. God is on our side. See, when you and I become believers, we change sides on the battlefield. I don't think many of us realize, realize this as Christians. Romans 5, verse 10, it says, So if while we were still enemies, God fully reconciled us to himself through, through the death of his son, then something greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, and because we share in his resurrection life, how much more will, will we be rescued from sin's dominion? The Bible says before we became believers, we were enemies of God. You say, well, I, wa I wasn't an enemy of God. Yes, you were. You were against him. You were his enemy, the Bible says. But now the Bible says in Christ, we change sides. Now God's on our side. Now God, now, now God is fighting for us. We are no longer enemies. The Bible says we are his friend. And instead of him being against us, he is now for us. We need to quit looking at everything that is against you and start seeing who is for you. Some of you need to get that here this morning. Quit looking at all the things that are stacked up against you and start thinking about who it is that is for you. That'll change your perspective. That'll change the way you live. That'll change the way you approach life every day when, when, when you wake up. But see, this God that we're talking about, he's not just a God. Th this is the part that you and I have to understand here. He's not, he's not just, he is Jehovah, the one and only true God. He is the creator, the sovereign, the, the author, the perfecter, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the, the, the creator of the stars. And the, 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 he, is the, he is the God of everything, the God who created you and created me. This is the God we're talking about. Not a God, the God, the Lord. That's extremely important. That's what that song we sang. Every other God is an idol. There's only one God. There's only one true God. You say, well, there's billions and millions of people serving other gods. It doesn't make a difference. There's only one. There's only one God. So I'm going to read this. Real, I, I've read this before, but it's been a while since I've done this. And I think this is important for you to look at this as a believer, to remind yourself of who it is that this God is. And I don't believe words can do justice, but these words, I believe, do a pretty good job. But we're going to look at the three aspects that I believe these things can only apply to God, to the Lord. The first one is his omnipotence. It means all-powerful. Monotheistic theologians regard God as having supreme power. This means God can do what he wants. It means he is not subject to physical limitations like man is. Being omnipotent, God has power over wind, Water, gravity, physics, etc. God's power is infinite or limitless. We, God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. That definition can only be applied to God. There's no other person that you can give that definition to except God. And then it's God's omniscience. Means all-knowing. God, God is all-knowing in the sense that he is aware of the past, present, and future. Nothing takes him by surprise. His knowledge is total. He knows all that there is to know and all that can be known. Now, do you understand this? We look at people in the world today and we, we admire their intelligence and, and, their, and, 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 their, and their intuition and the way they can think and plan and, and design computers and iPhones and all these different things. But the Bible said God knows, God knows 10,000 more than what they know. It's not even close. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. Every course, every college degree, anything you could study or, or put your mind to, God knows. There's nothing that God doesn't know. And then God's omnipresent. His omnipresence means he's all-present. The term means that God is capable of being everywhere at the same time. It means his divine presence encompasses the, the whole of the universe. There is no location where he does not inhabit. This should not be confused with pantheism, which suggests that God is synonymous with the universe itself. Instead, omnipresence indicates that God is distinct from the universe, but inhabits the entirety of it. He is everywhere at once. That's, that, that is unbelievable to me. <laughs> that God is here right now, and God is across the globe some, somewhere else. That God is everywhere at the same time. He, he, he is all here now. 
is not split up. He's not cutting himself in pieces and spreading himself out. He's omnipresent. That's the God that fights for you. That God fights for you. An all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God fights for you. See, we gotta, we got to get ourselves out of the box of this world. See, we, we put God in a box, and we say, God, this is, this is God, because this is our limits. Man's limited. Yes, we are, but God's not. God, God has no limitations. This is the God that is with you. So why is this so difficult for us to see? Because it requires faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. I trust God even when I don't see him. I, I trust him even when I don't feel him. But I, I trust that he is there. I know that God is real. Faith is not how I feel. It's rooted in the truth of what I believe. God is real. God is true. And the Bible says God did not leave us without evidence. What does the book, what does Romans chapter 1 say? That, that they, are, they are without excuse. Why? Because the creation itself is going to testify who God is. How can you look at a sunrise or a sunset? Or look at the moon or look at the stars or, 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 or just the limited amount of understanding man has about the galaxies and the planets and all these different things. And how can you sit back and say there's not a God? The Bible says for you to do that, guess what you have to do? You have to suppress the truth. In other words, what that tells me is somewhere in everybody's mind, there's an awareness that there is a God. They might not act like it. They might not show it. They might not say it. But somehow, somewhere in, in a tiniest speck in their mind, they know that there's a God. But the Bible says in Romans, guess what you got to do? You got to push it down. You got to suppress the truth. God is real. That's the God that's with you. And the Bible says, if that God, <laughs> if that God is with you, who can stand against you? It's time for us to start declaring the truth of what the word of God says. You've got to begin to speak these things over your life. Speak these things over your situation. Speak these things over your children, over your family, over your finances. Begin to speak truth over your life. Don't live by, what, by the way the world lives in fear and anxiety. Trust God. Speak the word of God over your life. The truth of what God says. And then 2 Chronicles uh, verse 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 15 says, he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Amen. God is fighting your battles. Amen. You say, you wake up and you, I mean, all of us have, we, we, have, we all live life, we, we all have life. And, you, and sometimes you just continually go through your register of all the things that you're confronted with. You just keep reading them through over and over and over. What do you say? What am I going to do? How am I going to accomplish this? How am I going to change this? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to how, how? How am I? But guess what the Bible says? God's fighting your battles. It's God that fights your battles, the Bible says. So Gamaliel was not a believer, but one thing he understood if God was part of what the apostles were doing, you will find yourselves fighting against God. And he knew that that was a losing battle. See, it doesn't matter what you're facing today. God is fighting for you. God is fighting for you. You, you, you need to know that. Pharaoh learned this the hard way. If you read the Old Testament and, I, and you read, you read the, the, the Bible, and I talked about how the, 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 the kingdom of God and the gospel took supernatural intervention of God for it to be where it is today. But that started all the way back in the Old Testament. God, God was doing miraculous intervention all the way back in the Old Testament. Why? Because what was the Bible pointing to? One thing, Jesus Christ. It was a crescendo that was building to a climax, and it was all about Jesus. So everything that was happening in the Old Testament was, was marching forward to the birth and the coming of a Messiah, of a Savior. That, that's what God was doing. So so back in the Old Testament, God was doing miracles. God was doing miracles too, and y'all know the, uh, the 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 story of of the nation of Israel when they were in Egyptian bondage. You know that you know God, God called Moses. The Bible says to go to Pharaoh and go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. The Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, 
and, 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 and Pharaoh would not let them go. When they, they, they had the locusts, they had the frogs, they had the hail, all these different things. It only would have taken one of those things for me. If I'd have opened up my oven and there'd have been a frog in my oven, I'd have let Israel go. <laughs> that'd have been it for me. They said the frogs were in the house. They were everywhere. That would have been the last plague. You can go. But the Bible says he, the, 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 his heart was hard. And the final plague came. It was, it was the death of what every firstborn. Every, every firstborn. Not in Goshen. They, when they, where Israel was, God protected them. That's the story of the Passover. That's where, we get the, that's where we get the Lord's Supper. That's where we get the Passover. God said, put the blood over your, over your doorpost. God said, when I see the blood, what am I going to do? I'm going to pass over. Every firstborn in, in, in uh, Egypt was killed. The Bible said there was great wailing. You can imagine waking up every house. The Bible says there was not a single house where someone was not dead. The Bible says at this point, Pharaoh let the people go. But Pharaoh's, Pharaoh wasn't finished. <laughs> his heart hardened again, the Bible says. And, he, and he, he decided to take his best charioteers and his best fighting men. And he, and he says, I'm not letting Israel go. I'm going to pursue them. And he pursued them in the wilderness. And if, you, and if you read this story, God deliberately led them up against the Red Sea. He did it on purpose. They, and and, and, and uh, Pharaoh thought that they were confused, that why would you go up against the Red Sea? You could go, you could go another way. But God was doing it on purpose. And God, God had, God had the, the Red Sea. He had the nation of Israel, and then he had Pharaoh's army pursuing that there was nowhere to go. But that was God's plan. That, 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 was, God's, that was God's intention. So look what, look, what, look what Moses said here in Exodus. I'm just going to break this up a little bit in Exodus chapter 14. Moses answered the people. This is as, as Pharaoh was approaching the nation. Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had, that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. See, Pharaoh, Pharaoh followed the Israelites, the Bible says, into the sea. That was a big mistake. Pharaoh thought that that was also open enough for him, but guess what? It wasn't open. It was open enough for the nation of Israel. God didn't part the sea for Pharaoh. He parted the sea for his people. And the Bible says Moses stretched out his hand and the water swept back. And every, every, not one of them, the Bible says, survived. But look what Moses told the people. He says, do not be afraid. Stand firm. That's what God is speaking to us today. I don't know who it is today in here, what you're facing, what you're going through, but God... God is telling you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, but do what? Stand firm. Now, Moses made the declaration of what God was going to do before God did it. That's faith. He spoke to them what God was going to do before it happened. God will deliver you. God will fight for you against your enemies. And no one will be able to stand against you. See, Pharaoh learned, and, and, and it took this for him to learn this, that he was not fighting against Israel. <laughs> he was fighting against God. And that's a battle nobody's going to win. When somebody comes against you and comes against me as a believer, they are not fighting you. They're fighting God. And I'm here to tell you, just as Gamaliel said, that is a battle they're not going to win. You're not going to win that battle. God is fighting for us. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have Ray just come and just begin to play. And as I close here today, I'm just going to ask you just to stand to your feet, please. And God's word is true. God's promises are true. God is faithful to us. So what, what battle is it that you're facing today? I think all of us in here can name at least one thing what we're facing. Sickness, it may be a, a, a marriage, uh, finances your job, your family, 
whatever it is that's coming against you, it will find itself fighting against God. That's the truth of what the Word of God says. See, Gamaliel, he, he might have got saved. I don't know. I pray he did. But I got to give it to him. He got profound revelation. He, and they, and he, so he prevented those apostles from dying. They were ready to kill him. That was the next step. And that's when he stood, he stood up and he said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, let's wait just one second here. Let's put them off for a second. Let's talk about this for a second. That was profound. God fights for you. God, God is fighting for you. Amen. But God fought for us over 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. That was the biggest battle that God ever won for us was our salvation. That God made it, made it a way for us to be saved when there was no way. That, that God made it possible for sinful man to be right with a holy God. His name is Jesus. Salvation, the Bible says, is found in no one else. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved, the Bible says, except the name of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And this morning, he holds his arms out with an invitation of love and forgiveness and mercy and grace. That's God's, that's God's invitation. Why would you reject that? That all God wants to do is love you and forgive you and heal you and give you a new life. So that's God's invitation this morning. I'm going to give two invitations, but that's the first one for salvation. And if that's you here this morning, you've, you've never prayed that prayer or you're not sure if you've ever done that. You, 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 you may have done it, but you don't know. But God says we need to know, to know for certain, to know for certain that if we were to die today, that we would be in the presence of God. If you don't have that confidence and that peace, God wants to give you that today. So I'll pray with you today before you go. If that's you, you've never, you've never accepted Jesus Christ. You've never confessed openly with your mouth that he is Lord. You can do that today and God will touch you. And God will change you. Amen. So that's you today. Just join me where I'm at here in the front. Don't be ashamed. God wasn't ashamed of us. Jesus hung on that cross. He bore it all for us. He was humiliated and shamed that we might be forgiven. Anybody here this morning, you've never confessed Christ. You want to make it public. You want to, you want to profess to the world that Jesus is Lord. Make your way up here to the front today, and I'll pray with you before you leave. everybody in the room here, God's on your side, right? God's fighting your battles and I I know there's got to be several people, you got to, there's some, everybody in here I believe has got to be facing at least one battle something you're, you're facing we're going to pray for that this morning, I'm just going to invite you just to come to the front and you're coming to the front we're just, I'm just going to ask Lee just to come up and we're just not going to take long, just lay hands and just, just encourage you that God is fighting your battles and might be a battle of marriage. Maybe maybe your marriage is falling apart. You want to you want us to come and stand in for your marriage today, or maybe it's a wayward child, or, or children that are going wayward, or healing, or sickness, or something. Let us stand and pray for you today. Make your way up here to the front, brother Wayne. Y'all can come up, brother Bill. Anybody else? Just come make your way up here.